Hello folks, this is my second video I'm making to replace the Zoom class we had that did not get recorded. I should say that I did not record because I probably forgot to do something. Anyway, the other video that I sent you a link to covered the basic electrical theory down through atomic structure. Uh, my favorite photo of the static charge and all the other means of creating movement of electrons. And when we did that and went through the water uh, analogy for electrical flow, which I think is extremely useful, especially for the project you're doing now, uh, Ohm's Law and the Power Formula, and then the group of formulas that can be derived from that, and that's where we stopped. So now I want to move on to how electricity gets from the power plant to your house, and when it gets to your house, how it gets distributed internally, the things that I think you should know from a design point of view um, going forward. So the electrical power grid, there are really eight pieces of this by the time it gets into the walls of your home, it starts with power generation. Power generation takes place in all kinds of power plants. Over on the right though, I have a pie chart, and that pie chart is the 2018 distribution of electrical sources in Maine. Maine is quite different than the rest of the country. The rest of the country has a much higher percentage of petroleum and coal than Maine does. But if you'll notice, in Maine, only 2% of electrical generation is with oil, and only an additional 3% is coal, but that 3% also includes inexplicably solar and other biomass, and I mean other biomass other than wood. So a total of probably no more than 3 to 4 percent of the source of heat that is used to generate electricity in Maine comes from uh, oil and coal. If you take a look, our primary source is hydroelectric. Maine gets more of its electricity from hydroelectric than any other single source. After that, it's wood and wood-derived biomass. So in, that, in other words, plants that burn scrap wood primarily or, or material that is derived from wood. So that's a renewable source and it's not as clean as hydroelectric or as natural gas in some ways, but it's pretty darn clean and it is um, renewable. After that is wind. Wind is a much bigger part of the main electrical grid than almost any other state. And then after those things, we start dealing with burning fossil fuels, and that's the natural gas. Not liquid, but uh, natural gas. Natural gas burns much cleaner than oil. So we're in pretty good shape here in Maine as far as producing electricity with renewable sources. And you'll remember that the reason why we need fuel is to turn a turbine using steam. So basically all that fuel does is boils water, turns it into steam, forces that steam through a turbine that turns a generator, and that generator then uh, produces electricity. Except, of course, where there's wind or hydro where there's no steam involved. In all those cases, we have an electromagnetic uh, field. You have a conductor turning inside a magnetic field uh, and then moving that electricity from its source to our homes. To get there, the second stage is transformers. Transformers boost voltage. They're called step-up transformers and they take whatever voltage exists as it's being generated and they increase it dramatically. And don't forget, electrical voltage is the equivalent of pressure in the water system. The more pressure you have, the further you can push electricity across long distances. Because it's uh, alternating current and because the voltage is so high, you have these very high voltage transmission lines, that's number three, that are able to carry a large amount of current. They're very large diameter. Most of them are aluminum. Probably all of them are aluminum. I don't know that for sure. but. And because of the high force pushing and the fact that it's AC, you can move electricity from the power plant over very long distances. When it gets someplace where it needs to be used, however, those very high voltages are too high for application in a business or in a home. So the voltage then has to be stepped down. Stepping down is what the substations do. A substation, I'm sure you've seen these, they almost always have chain link fence around them. Well, they, they actually probably all have chain link fence around them to keep people from going in and getting engaged in uh, something pretty dangerous. Um, but those step-down transformers then bring the voltage down to the point where it can be used. And then low voltage transmission lines, which are the ones we see in our neighborhoods, uh, are able to carry the current that results in 240 volts of pressure, or with 240 volts of pressure, to the meter that is there before it goes into the building where it will be used. 
that meter measures the amount of current in what's called kilowatt hours. And kilowatt hours are a measure of the power used, and kilowatts are you know, 1,000 watts. If you remember from the power formula, watts are a combination of, or the product of, of voltage and amperage, or electromotive force and inductive current measured in volts and amps. Um, and the amount of power used over a given hour is the way that electricity is charged. In Maine, we're paying about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. 15 cents a kilowatt hour is more than most of the rest of the country is paying. Um, it's about twice what some parts of the country are paying. But what that means is, as far as how much work can be done, I have uh, an electric car, as you know, and I noticed that the mileage on my car has improved now that the weather has warmed up. So I checked uh, this morning and I'm getting 4.8 miles per kilowatt hour. That means for my 15 cents in my car, I can drive almost 5 miles. So it's costing me a little more than 3 cents a mile in electricity to run my car. In contrast, I have a Ford F-150 6.4 liter, a 5.4 liter pickup truck that cost me close to 20 cents a mile at the price of gas prior to the COVID-19 crisis and that gas has dropped right now. But So when it goes through the meter, it then goes to your service panel and that's where we're going to go next. The service panel is what distributes the, the load in your home and it's full of overload protection devices and they're called thermal overload protection devices because they work by measuring the amount of heat that's being pulled through and the more current being pulled through a system the more friction the more friction the more heat when that heat exceeds a certain level that circuit breaker breaks and that's what protects your home against fire or at least it increases the protection against fire it doesn't make your house fireproof of course and then people have wires in their walls for the most part or in commercial applications or in some domestic applications or residential the wires are on the walls and that 240 volts that goes from the uh, substations through to the meter then gets um, divided into 220 volt uh, circuits inside your home and the 120 volt circuits can either could be combined to have 240 volts to a particular appliance or it can be used individually and the current that is being generated by those two voltages ranges from 15 amps up to 50 amps in most homes. Although I will say 50 amps is probably unusual in a lot of homes. So moving to the service panel. What we have on the left hand side is a series of circuit breakers. These are all 20 amp circuit breakers and in every case these circuit breakers are individual breakers. You will notice that down here you can tell there's a hole in the side. That hole is there so you can put a pin that goes down through two of them and then makes each of them work uh, together. You can't turn one off without the other one getting turned off as well. Uh, and that's so that you could combine them and use them for 240 volt appliances, in which case you don't want just one side to be turned off. That's a little unusual now. You don't see them being pinned together very much anymore. Instead, people buy breakers that are already joined together, and I'll show you a couple of those in a little bit. Um, you notice the numbering over here when you have uh, the service panel. Uh, service panel, well, you can say there's two sides of the service panel, and there's a little piece of it over here on the outside. This is what it looks like on the inside. So there's a, a row on the left and a row on the right. The row on the left is the uh, odd numbers, the row on the right is the even numbers, and those numbers simply are there to identify individual circuits. But if you look over here at this schematic, coming into your home are two hot wires, and those hot wires are called hot because current is flowing through them. You also have a uh, neutral, and you also have a ground. In this particular case, I'm looking just at those two wires right there and they go to two opposite sides of the service panel. One goes to the left, one goes to the right. That wire right there is carrying, this wire right here is carrying 120 volts. This wire right here is also carrying 120 volts. Since they're both 120 volts, that gives you 240 volts total if you would have combined them together. Now, right here, you have the main breaker and the main breaker is what controls all the power coming into your home so if you're 
anxious to keep the electricity from flowing into the walls for some reason. Something's going wrong. You hear some arcing. Something unusual is happening. The easiest and safest way to prevent anything from going further wrong is to just turn off that main breaker. At that point, the current can't get past this point. So unless what's going wrong is going wrong here, and that does sometimes happen. I actually had a main breaker melt down on me one time. Um, and that was very unusual. It's the only time I've ever heard of that, actually. It was in my home. Um, but if you turn that off, now current doesn't get anywhere in your house. And that's, uh, that's the main breaker. That main breaker is, is um, carrying 240 volts. Now, the amps that it's carrying depends on the load requirements in your home. My house has fairly low electrical demand. Even with an electric car, I have a 100 amp service. Uh, it used to be fairly common to have 125 or 150. Now, though, almost every home that's built now has a 200 amp service. And Jake tells me that he worked on a home that had a 250 amp service. And the reason why that number is so high and the reason why almost nobody is willing to build a new home with anything less than 200 amps is because we keep increasing the electrical load on most homes by adding more and more appliances to it. This 250 is, is really high and that probably is a very large, you know, fairly um, you know, expensive home. Probably has a three car garage, might have a shop of some kind. Um, the purpose of that would be to support an unusual electrical load. Now if uh, we continued on down the panel, the current comes in here, current comes in here, that wire provides that side, that wire provides that side. If we look at what's going on up here, that's what's called a neutral bus bar, identified right there. Neutral is how you describe the wire that carries current back to the source after it's been used. If you recall from the very first slide here, um, the very first slide showed you that there is a need for a circuit to be complete in order for current to flow. So current, when it's being used, flows out through a hot wire, goes to whatever it's doing. Uh, down here, in this case, it's a 240 volt air conditioner. This is also because it's 240 volts, has a hot line that's red and a hot line that's black. Those carry current to the air conditioner. The white carries current back from the air conditioner to the service panel. Since all the neutrals are connected together, you can't connect the hot wires together, but all the neutrals are connected together, they're all screwed down onto this thing called a neutral bus bar. Also on that neutral bus bar is this wire right here, which is meant to, to show that it's a bare wire. That's why it's kind of a bronzish color. So if you look in a, uh, the cables coming out of your service panel, they're going to have hot wires, they're going to have a neutral wire, and they're going to have a ground wire. They could have one hot wire or two hot wires, but they're gonna, only going to have one neutral and one ground. The neutral and the ground are all connected electrically together, and all of them then return current back to the literal ground, where you have a ground rod driven into the ground outside your home and sometimes it's also connected to the plumbing system in your home which is also connected to ground so that you can end up with a complete circuit where current comes into your house goes through some kind of device goes back goes back to ground and that complete circuit is what allows you to have electrical flow now do another um, so if you take a look at, at what's happening down here, these are your two sides of the service panel. And in both cases, the very top one, and that's when I've wired houses, I'll show you something I did earlier, I, I do the same. I put the 240 volts on the top. There's no requirement that you do that, but it seems like every electrician does. So the ones requiring 240 would be things that generate or that require a lot of heat. An electric dryer, if the dryer itself is using uh, electricity to develop the heat and not gas has to be a 240 volt circuit. Some air conditioners, not all, in fact not most air conditioners in Maine, but air conditioners in other parts of the country are frequently 240 volts because they have to draw a, a large amount of current in order to work effectively. You also though have 
down here in the kitchen appliance, uh, kitchen receptacle 20 amp circuit, that's 120 volts down here. And it's 120 volts because that's the receptacle that you plug stuff into. There's another one over here that's a 15 amp circuit. That would be only for lights. You know, it's funny, I have a tablet with a little pen, but I find that it's actually easier for me if I use my uh, mouse to do that. But 15 amp circuit would normally be only for lights. You, you can't um, supply current to a receptacle to 15 amp circuit because the things you plug into that might be drawing more than 15 amps. So the two top ones are 240 volts, and you know that because there's a red wire coming from one, there's a black wire coming from the other. Electrically, this breaker is connected to that bus bar right there. This breaker is actually connected to that bus bar right here. I'll show you a photo of the inside of one of these in a minute to show you how that works. But the two breakers that are side by side are on opposite sides of the panel. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to combine the two and get 240 volts. Now, this is a, a house service panel. And this is a service panel that has um, that's been opened up. And these are actual breakers. There's a photograph of breakers. And if you look on this side over here, you'll notice that right down here, those shiny things you see right there are the bus bars coming down on either side. And you notice how they go back and forth, back and forth. And they do that because <clears throat> what you need when you have these two side by side is any adjoining breakers have to be drawing current from opposite sides. And so internally there's a little bus bar that comes down here, another one that comes down here, and they just go back and forth and back and forth. So when you snap the circuit breaker on there, it connects electrically to this one, the next one down connects to that one, and that's on opposite sides, therefore you can pull 240 volts. The red wire you see is to a 240 volt um, system, and it's being served by that breaker right there. Over here there's a bigger image of it, so we're talking right here. And you'll notice that there's one switch connected together for the two different breakers. One of the breakers has a red line coming off. The other one has a black line coming off. The red is 120 volts. The black's 120 volts. Together it's 240. They also have that white wire right there. There's your neutral. That's how current comes back to the system. All of those are connected to the circuit that comes in from the top on opposite sides. This is what it would look like on the outside. There's your main breaker. Main breaker, by the way, is normally side to side, as are all these. So that illustration I showed earlier that has it going up and down is simply a schematic. Um, now down here we have the kitchen lights. And the kitchen lights is a black line coming off here and a white line coming off here. That's it. There's also a ground. But there's no second red wire because this is 120 volt. The lights are 120 volt. The refrigerator is 120 volt. The wall outlets are 120 volts. Some other outside outlets are 120 volts as well. So um, some information about 240 versus 120. These are nominal voltages. In other words, just like all the other things I've talked about in class that are nominal, Nominal means that it's the name we give it, but in reality, it's nothing. It's probably not going to be exactly 240 volts or 220 volts. So actual voltages can vary between 220 and 240 when they're being distributed, or between 110 and 120. And all the devices in your home are designed so that any one of those, anything within that range, is sort of like tolerance ranges, but anything within that range will work just fine. Sometimes the current coming into your house drops below the voltage required here or here. It's known as a brownout. And when that happens, you would notice it because your lights dim a little bit. If you're running something, it might sort of slow down. Most of the things in your home, most of the appliances in your home, I don't know why I can't highlight that anymore, but most of the appliances in your home are 120 volts. So your toaster, your hair dryer, your lamps, your computer, all those things are 120 volts. They plug into a standard receptacle. Electric clothes dryers, electric stoves, ovens, some air conditioners are 240 because either they take a lot of juice to run or they generate heat. If you have electric heat in your home, the electric heat is always supplied by 240 volts. But Maine electric heat is just such a bad idea in Maine that you almost never see it. 
I says most, you're going to really say every home is likely at this point to have 240 volts available at the service panel as I showed you before. Two bus bars each carries 120, single circuits in the bus bars are 120 and then you combine them for 240. Uh, worldwide, um, that's not always the same thing. In the United States, we generally use appliances that are 120. That's true also in Canada, that's true in Mexico, that's true in Japan and Taiwan, and in most Central American countries, at least I looked it up and it said so. I don't, I don't have direct experience with every country in Central America. But in Europe, it's a little different. In most other countries in the world, apparently most African countries and uh, European countries, Middle Eastern countries, their standard is 240 volts at the wall. Now, that's not, there's no big deal unless you buy a toaster in Kansas and then decide to move to uh, Germany and try plugging it in. Anybody that's done any traveling in Europe knows that you have to take with you, if you have your own hair dryer, for instance, or shave, you know, electric shaver, you have to take with you a um, converter of some kind. Now, it doesn't hurt anything to have 240 volts. It just means that you can push the current with much less effort because 240 volts puts more electromotive force. The whole thing comes down to how is the device designed? Is it designed to use 120 or 240 volts? Um, now, as far as individual circuits go, circuits have to be complete. We looked at that in the very first slide. You open a switch, you don't have a complete circuit. Electrons can't flow. 120 volt circuits use one breaker. Black carries a current to the devices and white neutral carries it back to the service panel. 240 volt circuits use two breakers tied together. There's another example over here. That other example shows a single breaker that's 20 amp and then it shows a double breaker and that is a 40 amp breaker. Probably that is providing current to an electric stove. Could be a dryer but it's probably an electric stove. Um, the neutral and the ground are both tied together because the ground is actually just an alternative to the neutral. So again, if you've got hot wire and current goes through it and it goes to an appliance of some kind and then comes back and that white wire, which is the neutral, <coughs> it comes back. If something were to happen in the appliance here, something goes wrong and the white wire gets short-circuited. One of the problems with uh, wiring is if the two wires come together, you have a short circuit, it goes right past the appliance and then tries to go whipping back and with no resistance at all, current just wants to go faster and faster and faster and faster until it heats up so much that if there were no thermal overload device, it would burn right through the wires. I've seen this happen before in an automotive setting when somebody, I don't recall who, might have been me, um, got some wires reversed on the car and it just burned right through the uh, the wire. It was a long time ago, but it, it did happen. Um, the problem is that if something happens internally, a little bit of a short, but it's not enough to really have current flowing directly through, but that white wire for some reason gets rubbed bare, comes loose, and it's up against the side of the appliance. Let's say the appliance is a toaster and a toaster has a metal jacket for the most part. If internally that white wire is touching that jacket and you touch the outside jacket of the toaster, you're now in that circuit. And so to prevent or to reduce the likelihood people will die is an alternative path back to ground. And the alternative path back to ground here is going to be that bare ground wire. So there's a ground wire that's literally attached to the jacket of your toaster and it goes back and parallels the white and goes all the way back to the service panel where it then joins to the white as an alternative path back to ground. And it's an alternative because your body has relatively high resistance. This wire has very low resistance, so most of the current is going to go through the lower resistance wire and some of that current is going to go through your body. Um, so, yeah. Let's go to the next slide. So this is what happens. This is how your, your actual uh, receptacles are wired in the wall. Um, these are called through wiring. And this is how almost all of your receptacles are wired. So if you take a look at this, down here the source, that source is your service panel. That's the panel in the basement that has the switches side to side. And one of them has a black wire that comes out and does this. 
and then it has a white wire that comes out and does that and it has a ground wire that comes out and does this so the source in this case is your service panel in the basement well it might not be in the basement it could be on the first floor but that big gray panel that has all the switches on it what happens is electrons flow through here or at least they're available to flow through here they don't flow until you put something on or plug something in but the current is flowing like this through that hot wire and then it goes and it connects to your receptacle with that little screw right there. Now that screw, I mean it is possible if you've done any wiring to buy what are called back wired receptacles where you, you strip a little wire uh, insulation off the wire, you push it in a hole in the back and little teeth grab it. Um, I don't know any electricians that are willing to use those and I'm not willing to use them. So instead of back wiring, everybody I know takes that little screw, opens it up, puts a loop in the black wire, puts it around clockwise on that screw, tightens the screw down nice and tight, and that makes a good, secure um, connection. One thing the electrical code prohibits is putting more than one wire under a screw. And there's a good reason for that, because if you've got two wires under the same screw, they're touching in that one tiny little tangency right here, and all that has to happen is one of those wires gets bumped a little bit in that direction, a little bit in that direction, and now that screw is no longer tight and you end up with arcing. So you cannot put more than one wire under a screw. Now on a receptacle, there are two colors of the screws. One is bronze and it's related to the shorter of the two slots. That's the hot side. The other is silver and it's related to the longer of the two slots. And that, so I'm making glasses on a face, doesn't it? Let me just, no, I'm kidding. Um, I sorry anyway it relates to that longer slot which is a neutral slot um, and that's the one that the white wire gets attached to let me just clear that and then start over now one of the things you'll notice here is this wire comes in it's tied to that screw internally because of this little bus bar right there that means you've got power that's available here and power that's available here same thing on the other side internally those two screws are connected so you've got a path back to ground from here or a path back to ground from here and I will say that this is the bare ground the alternative ground it is not normally part of your electrical circuit in fact if it is there's something wrong normally all you need are those two and when I was young and working in shops for the first time it was highly unusual to see a receptacle that had three slots they all had two slots um, that ground was introduced, I can't tell you exactly what year, but I know I was 15 in 1960, what year was I doing that? It's 1966, and I was working in a, in a sheet metal shop, and um, that sheet metal shop had nothing but two-prong receptacles, and all of a sudden all the tools we were buying came with three prongs, and I remember my first task that summer was to break the third prong off of all of the drills and other things we bought so that we could plug them in. That is a really bad idea these days because you lose that, that alternative ground. So coming back now. So this screw, when the wire is attached to it, energizes the top of the duplex receptacles and the bottom as well on one circuit. In order to have current that goes from this receptacle to the next one downstream, there's a little bus bar, again, right here, that connects the two screws. And it's a physical little piece of metal that makes them electrically connected, which is how current gets to here. And it's also how current passes through the device and comes down here. So this is called a pass-through device because current goes into the device and then out of the device to the next device, where it then goes into the device and out of that device to the next device, in, out, to the next device until finally at the end there's nothing else attached here because there's nowhere else to go. So the terminal receptacle is only going to have current going in and not coming out again. So those two screws are just unused. Now it is possible to break these two into separate receptacles. And to do that, you put a little teeny screwdriver, not that tiny, but you put a screwdriver in a slot and you just twist that and snap that bus bar off. Not this one. That one shouldn't be snapped off. Well, it shouldn't be snapped off unless you're a very experienced master electrician and have some good reason to. 
but the only thing you should be breaking is right here. And when you snap that off, now current runs in here and stops, energizes this, does not energize here, and does not go downstream. So what has to happen in a case like this is you have to have a separate wire coming in, and that separate wire coming in is normally the red wire, and it would come in and go directly to that screw right there so that you would now have two hot wires, one on each different circuit, and then that would be on one circuit, and then this would be on a different circuit. And I'm just going to put DIFF because it's so hard to write with this thing. And again, that would be a red wire coming in here. Now, if you do have the separate lines coming in, in order to go downstream, you have to do something called pigtailing. And there's an example of pigtailing right here. The example is with the ground wires. So this just means goes to ground. That would be attached to the box that this is in. In other words, this receptacle is going to be in a box. The box is probably plastic in your home, in which case that would not have happen because plastic doesn't conduct electricity. If it's a metal box, the ground itself has to go to the edge of the box. So that's what that little dot means right there. Most of the time in your home, that little dot's not going to have any significance, so just ignore it for now. So what about this ground wire, that alternative path to ground? It's coming in. It's a bare wire. It doesn't go directly to the green. There's a green screw here as well. So two silver, two bronze. The two silver are connected. The two bronze are connected. The bronze can be broken apart. The silver shouldn't be. The green is a ground, but the wire coming from the cable, from the service panel, doesn't go directly to this because you need to ground everything on the, down the line, and there's only one screw on a receptacle. It's a ground screw or on a light or anything else that, that does electricity, and that screw is always colored green. So what you do is you pigtail. You bring a wire in, and this is called a wire nut doesn't have to be a wire nut. It can also be a crimp collar, which is what most electricians prefer. I certainly prefer it because it takes up less room. It's also easier to put on, actually. Um, but uh, there are times when you, when you have to use one of these wire nuts, and wire nuts are widely used. So what happens is this. One wire comes into this nut, another wire comes out of it and goes to your device, and a third wire comes out of it and goes downstream to the next receptacle where it goes into another wire nut with a wire that comes out and goes to the device and another wire that comes out and goes downstream to the next device. If they're in metal boxes, the boxes themselves are all grounded as well, and that's what that represents. But chances are really good that you do not have metal boxes. In fact, I'd be shocked if your home had metal boxes unless it was fairly old. Most of the time, those boxes are now made out of plastic. Um, so the green has to be carried through by pigtailing. It is possible to pigtail all the wires, and I do know of some situations where electricians have pigtailed everything so that if something goes wrong with this device, it doesn't kill the power downstream. The idea here is that if you pigtail everything together, you no longer are using your devices as pass-through. You're going directly to each device. There's a couple problems I have with that. One of them is there's a lot of wire and a lot of wire nuts in the box. You need to have a deep box. And even if you have a deep box, it's a lot to manage. And the more wires you have in a box, the more likely it is that something will go wrong when you try to push everything back in. Wiring, electrical wiring, by the way, takes a certain amount of strength. And sometimes that strength is because you're pulling wire, and sometimes it's because you're pushing wire into a box. The other problem I have with this, though, is this. If something goes wrong with that device right there, that means internally something broke. I'd like to know that. If you have a series, a circuit with a series of receptacles, I'd like to find out that something is wrong anywhere by having something plugged in anywhere and having it not work. So just say I have a lamp plugged into the last receptacle. If I, th if I didn't through wire everything, if I didn't have the wiring going through each device, this could be working fine, and over here I could have something internally wrong, some arcing, something else happening, and not know it, not realize it, because I don't have anything plugged into it. Whereas if I use the through wiring, the through um, terminals to, to take current downstream, this is going to stop working if something goes wrong here, and then I know I've got to go look for a problem. 
that's my feeling. I know some electricians who disagree. Actually, I know one electrician. I've only known one electrician. That was some time ago who insisted on pigtailing everything. Um, and, uh, you know, he, his point was you ought to be able to yank something out of here and disconnect it and still have power downstream. But All right, let's move on to the next slide. Next slide, we're going to look at the actual code requirements, the National Electrical Code requirements. Now that you understand something about the theory of electricity, how it gets into your home, and how it gets distributed, let's look at the requirements that you need to take into account if you're designing a residence. We're going to deal with only residences. If you're really, if you're designing commercial applications, you need to know a lot more than this. But for the sake of this print reading class, what I want you to understand is that there are regulations covering how electrical work is done in a home. There are also regulations covering how plumbing is done in a home, um, how boilers are put into a home, all kinds of things. But we're looking right now at the National Electrical Code, which is a fire code. And I'm looking now at the 2017, which is the most current code. And I did update my slides to the 2017 requirements when they came out. Um, but I will also tell you that I'm not an electrician. I just happen to read the code periodically, and I've taught basic electrical theory and even electrical wiring to, uh, to students over the years. So this is my understanding of the 2017 code. Um, and I'm quite confident in it, but again, I'm not a master electrician. So we're going to start with the kitchen. The kitchen is the place that has the most rules in the residence because it has the most application of, of electricity. So first, you have to have a receptacle within two feet of any point above a countertop. Now what that means is this. Here's a kitchen and there's a countertop. So if I were to take and say, hey, here's a point right here all above that counter, along the wall in either direction, I cannot go more than two feet without finding a receptacle looks a little bit like that without finding a receptacle measured along the wall. So if I had a receptacle right here, I'm going to go into this drawing. If I had a receptacle right there and I said from here to here is two feet, from here to here is another two feet, well if there's a point right here someplace within that two foot distance on either side, there has to be a receptacle. That doesn't mean the receptacles are two feet apart. People make that mistake sometimes. It means that they could be four feet apart along the wall because that would mean any point between them would be within two feet of those receptacles. You stop at the sink and start on this side because you don't want cords going across the sink. You stop at the stove and then go over here. You don't want cords going across the stove. If there's a countertop space that is longer than two feet or two feet or longer, it has to have a receptacle. If you have an island, it has to have at least one receptacle. In this case, this is a pretty good size island and it would need more than one receptacle. So the first rule is any point along the, the counter, any place at all, if you've got a um, blender sitting here, you've got to be able to plug it in within two feet of that blender. That's why uh, the cords on toasters and blenders and toaster ovens, you might have noticed, they're fairly short. Um, I don't know that they're exactly two feet, but I'm guessing they're just about two feet, and that's because of that rule. And the purpose of that rule, just to make the point, is so you don't say, oh, I've got a receptacle over here, I've got my blender here, I'll just run that cord right over the burners to my stove and plug it in, because that obviously would be a problem. Now we go back to the PowerPoint. You also need two separate 20 amp circuits above the counter. Um, that doesn't, they don't have to be evenly distributed. You could have one receptacle on one circuit and five receptacles on a different circuit, but you have to have two, at least two. You don't have to, you can have more than two if you'd like, but you have to have at least two receptacles above the counter here. Um, now one of the ways to accomplish that is to run what's known as multi-wire uh, uh, multi cable and actually split each receptacle, and I talked about that earlier, and have one circuit going to the top and a different circuit going to the bottom of all of your receptacles. Now not only do you have two circuits, but in any given location, one of them is the top receptacle and one of them is the bottom of the duplex receptacles. So if there's one spot on the counter where you happen to put your toaster oven and your 
Belgian waffle maker and whatever else draws heat. And you plug those both into the receptacles that's, that are sitting right there. You're not as likely to um, try to draw too much current and then cause that thermal overload device to pop. Every receptacle, even the light, all the, all the outlets, I should say, every outlet in the kitchen has to be AFCI protected. Well, every outlet has to be AFCI protected in the whole house now. AFCI protected means arc fault circuit in protect, circuit protected or arc fault current interrupter. The I stands for interrupter. And we'll talk a little bit more. I'll talk a little bit about, more about this later. That used to be only true in bedrooms. Before that, it didn't exist as a rule at all. An arc fault current interrupter is a, is a device that has a computer chip that is able to determine if there's any arcing going on internally to an outlet. So on occasion, wires loosen up, especially backwired uh, receptacles, which is why most electricians won't use them. And if they loosen up a little bit and you get this slight little arcing, it sometimes is enough so it doesn't cause anything to, to pop in the breaker. But over time, that little bit of arcing creates enough heat, so eventually it starts a fire. That used to be only in the bedroom, so that if something was going on in the bedroom, it would shut down because if you're sleeping, you're less likely to notice smoke, etc. But that's now been expanded to include every outlet in the home, including the kitchen. GFCI is funny. It's similar in the sense that it interrupts the current, turns off. But instead of looking for arc faults, it looks for ground faults. The ground fault's a little different. The ground fault is when you have current flowing through the black wire. So here you've got current flowing this way with the black wire. And you've got current flowing this way with the white wire. So that one's black. The first one's white. That's supposed to be a B. Let's see if I can do that a little better. All right. So forget that. <clears throat> so it goes out here. So you've got all these little electrons, all these little negatively charged things here, all these little negatively charged things here. What a ground fault current interrupted does is it measures all the electrons going through the black wire and it measures the ones going back through the white wire. And as soon as there's a difference, as soon as there are fewer electrons going back through the white wire than through the black wire, that's a 15 milliamp difference, by the way, a very small difference. As soon as it notices a difference, it just shuts down. And the reason is because if the current going through the black and then back through the white aren't equal, that means some current's leaking out of the system someplace. If it's leaking out of the system, that means it's possible for you to get engaged in that current. So if we go back to our toaster, it might mean that the white wire is like a little bare spot and it's up against the side of the toaster. And so a little bit of current's going out through the side of the toaster. When that happens and you put your hand on it and you're pulling current through that, through your body, some of the electrons that would be going back through the white wire are now going through your body. The ground fault current interrupter notices that, turns it off, and the purpose is to prevent you from dying. Now, the reason why this requirement is within six feet of the sink is because if you are engaged in water, if your body is your hands in the sink, you're in a bathtub, the water is connected directly to your plumbing system. Your plumbing system is connected directly to the ground, which means that you then have completed a circuit that goes through your body, through the water, into the plumbing system, and then back to ground. So if there's a receptacle within six feet of a sink in your home, it must be ground fault current interrupted to prevent or to reduce the likelihood and almost guarantees it'll prevent you from being killed if you have your hand in the sink and put your hand on the toaster and a little bit of current starts going through your body. Bang, this thing turns off. I think it's actually three milliamps now that I think of it. And I think it turns off in three milliseconds. Apparently enough so you wouldn't even really notice you had a, a current going through. Um, other requirements, NEC requirements. Electric stoves require a 240 volt circuit. If you have a dishwasher that's built in or a garbage disposal, each of them must have a dedicated circuit. They can't be on the same circuit as these two. These are called small appliance circuits, by the way, the two uh, circuits up here. So you can't have anything else on those two small appliance circuits. If you have a dishwasher, it has to have its own circuit. A garbage disposal has its own circuit refrigerator has to have its own dedicated 20 amp circuit and the reason for that is to protect your food from spoiling because if you have your refrigerator on the same circuit as a small appliance circuit and you plug into you know your Belgian waffle maker and your toaster oven and 
and blow that breaker or pop that breaker, the refrigerator stops working. And if you don't notice it, the food all spoils. So to reduce the likelihood of that, refrigerator has to have a 20 amp circuit. The only thing that um, should be plugged in to that one receptacle that the refrigerator is plugged into, because that circuit can only have one receptacle on it, because otherwise you could plug other things in. It can be a duplex receptacle. It's not required that it be a simplex, because the other part of the receptacle, traditionally, when people had kitchen clocks that plugged in, is you'd plug your kitchen clock in, put it directly above the refrigerator, and if you came home and said, hey, that clock is 20 minutes slow, it would tell you that you probably had lost power to the refrigerator for 20 minutes and that you might have to can be concerned about food spoilage. If you have a microwave oven that's built in, it requires a dedicated 20 amp circuit. That's not true if it's a portable microwave that you buy at the store after you move into your house and set it on the counter, that becomes a small appliance then. And the lighting in the kitchen must have its own dedicated circuit of 15 or 20 amps. If it's 15 amps, you can run 14 gauge wire to it, but you can't run that wire to any place, anything else. If it's 20 amps, you can run 12 gauge wire. Um, there's no particular reason for it to be 20 amps because especially now with the new LED lighting, um, lighting circuits have become so efficient that a 20 amp circuit would, would really be overkill. Now we go to bathrooms. Bathroom, every bathroom in your home has to have at least one 20 amp circuit. If there's a heater built in, one of those ceiling heaters normally, where you walk in the bathroom and there's three switches, one for the fan, one for the light, and one for the heater, the heater itself, if it's in the ceiling, has to have a dedicated circuit running to that device, even though you've already got a cable running to that device for the electrical electricity that's required for the fan and the light they have to be separated from the circuit for the heater. GFCI protection is required in all outlets in the bathroom, not just those within six feet. So if you have a fairly large bathroom and you have receptacles on the wall, and those receptacles are nine feet away from water, doesn't matter if they're in the bathroom, they have to be GFCI protected. There must be at least one receptacle within three feet of the outside edge of a sink. If you have dual sinks, the common thing to do with a dual sink, of course, Let's say here's one sink here, here's another sink here, then you're going to have a receptacle. You're probably going to put that receptacle between them because now it's within three feet of both sinks. You must be able in every room in your house to turn on lights by walking through the door. So a switch for lighting must be placed directly inside the door on the non-hinged side. In other words, you can't have a situation where you open the door, the switch is behind the door, you have to walk in the room, walk around the, the door, and then put the switch on. The idea here is before you enter a room, you should have a way of turning lights on in that room. That switch does not have to go to a light. It could go to a receptacle that is a switch receptacle into what you can plug a lamp. And then uh, this is the same requirement for the, as you have for the rest of the house. No point along the wall, a little different than the kitchen now. Above the counters, no point can be more than two feet from receptacle. In the rest of the house, no more than six feet from receptacle, and that's true in the bathroom as well. Living areas. Again, wall switch for every room. You go into a room, you got to be able to turn the light on. No point on the wall can be more than six feet from receptacle. Now again, just to remind you, what that means is if you're looking say at, hang on a minute here, let's take a look at uh, the study right here. Okay, in this study right here, if I were to pick any point on the wall, I say right there. Now, if I pick that point on the wall, if I go six feet in this direction along the wall, you notice I'm not doing this. That is not the way you measure. You don't measure across the floor, you measure along the wall. So if I say I want to go from that point right there, measured along the wall, by the time I've gone six feet, I have to run into a receptacle unless in the other direction going six feet, I have a receptacle. So the fact is the receptacles can be as much as 12 feet apart along the wall. Now that doesn't mean you can't put more receptacles in there than are required. And I think you recall Jess and I having a lot of fun with the fact that she had so many receptacles in her in her study because she's going to do her own wiring and they're going to be cheap um, that I thought it it might actually be overkill. But again, it's up to you. You want to have a receptacle every foot just because you do? Then go ahead. There are certainly places where you might, if you have a shop of some kind or a workbench of some kind, 
um, and you want to have receptacles above that bench or if you got a computer room or a television room um, where you have a number of things that need to get plugged in you could easily have multiple receptacles that are much closer than that but the requirement is a minimum of six feet from any point along the wall Uh, if there's a wall that's greater than two feet long, it has to have receptacles. So you have a little short wall that comes out, and you're going, yeah, that wall's three feet, but I don't really need a receptacle there. Uh, yeah, you do. Um, every receptacle in the house now has to be FCI protected. And by the way, tamper-proof as well. This one I wish were not the case. The reason I wish it were not the case is I like the idea, but you know, you can buy things to plug into your outlet so that if you have, or your receptacles, so if you have a toddler or an infant that, that's like crawling, they can't stick things into it and that's that's what that's for and by the way it's, it's a serious issue um, but the reason I wish that you didn't have a requirement for tamper proof receptacles is because it's really hard to plug things in and out of them uh, and for example my brother-in-law's mother lives in an assisted living near us and so um, actually before the before the COVID-19 thing we used to go and visit her but if she had to Plug, if she had to move something in her apartment and unplug it from one place and plug it into something else, she'd have to call me to go over and do it because she didn't have the strength to pull something out of the wall and push it in with a tamper-proof receptacle. Even though there's kind of a technique, but she just couldn't figure it out. Now she has to get somebody from the staff to do it if she wants to move things around. Mostly she doesn't. Anyway, but they have to be tamper-proofed as well. Other general living things, stairs all have to be eliminated. You have to have light over the stairs. And that light has to be controlled from both the top and the bottom. That's a three-way switch issue, and we looked at that in one of the classes. If you have a hallway longer than 10 feet, it must have at least one receptacle. And the three-way switches are required at each end of the hallway as well. So if we look at this plan, uh, there's no real hallways here. Let's look at the second floor. All right, second floor has, yeah, there's a hallway that goes literally that hallway starts here and goes all the way to here. That hallway is, is well over 10 feet. I'm just going to check the distance of it. So if we go from here to here, that hallway is 26 feet long. By the way, I, I drew this up. I won't say I designed this. The people who owned it designed it. I did not like that arrangement. I don't care for hallways that long, but, but it wasn't my decision to make. The point is, that hallway is long enough, so there's got to be a receptacle someplace. So probably you'd put it right here. It's not living space, so you don't have to have a receptacle within six feet of any point along the wall. But if it's more than 10 feet, you have to have some place to plug the vacuum cleaner, and there has to be lighting, and you have to be able to control the lights from each end of the hallway. So you need a three-way switch on each end of that hallway. Now we get to the laundry room and the garage. The laundry room and the garage um, have a common, some a common, a couple of common requirements. They both require at least one dedicated 20 amp circuit. So if you have a laundry room or even a portion of a room in which you have a washer and dryer, the washer and dryer have to have at least one dedicated circuit and any garage has to have one dedicated circuit per car space. Um, an electric dryer must have a 30 amp minimum 2240 volt dedicated circuit, it must be grounded and GFCI protected if it's within six feet of a sink. So basically, anytime you're within six feet of water, you need GFCI protection. All the other receptacles um, in the laundry uh, and the garage have to be both AFCI and GFCI protected, with a couple of exceptions for the garage. When you get to the garage, oh, by the way, you need one light switch in a garage, but you need one in a laundry room as well. Anyway, the garage has to have at least one light switch and has to have at least one light. It has to be at one receptacle per car space. Garage door openers have to have 20 amp receptacles available. Um, those are not readily accessible, which gets me to the next one. All readily accessible receptacles in a garage must be G GFCI protected. And GFCI protected, again, it's a ground fault current protection that's designed so that if you're in a moist area and therefore potentially grounded, if something were to go wrong internally to a device, an electrical device, a current passing through your body as a result would result in the ground fault current interrupter breaking. The reason it says readily accessible is this. Very commonly people have garage door openers, which you can't plug things in and out of without a step ladder. They're not readily accessible. They don't have to be ground faulted. Uh, people also often put freezers in their garage. Freezers 
um, are a problem and so is a refrigerator a problem on a ground faulted receptacle because of nuisance tripping. Ground faults do sometimes trip not because there's anything wrong but because there's something plugged in that has a motor and the initial motor surge causes a false drop and that false drop causes nuisance tripping and that just means it trips but not because there's anything wrong then you have to go and reset it if that happens on your freezer and you don't notice it for a couple of weeks you've got a problem same is true in the refrigerator now the AFCI GFCI WP receptacles let's talk about those for a minute any outdoor receptacle has to be GFCI protected and also has to be weatherproof. Weatherproof is a designation for the receptacle and for the enclosure that the receptacle is in. The best weatherproof uh, enclosure is recessed into the wall with a cover over it that has a gasket on it. But you have to lift the cover and you know whatever you plug in has to go inside that, that recess. There's others that are not recessed that have covers over individual receptacles. But whatever you do, it has to be weatherproofed. Everything has to be GFCI protected because outdoors you're much more likely to be standing in water. And this just goes and reminds you what it does. It measures the current flowing from the panel to a circuit. It measures the current flowing back to the service panel. And then any small difference will trip the GFCI. The arc fault current interrupter is required in living spaces. That senses arcing and does the same thing. You can put the two of them together on an entire circuit or receptacle. Now, you can do this protection one of two ways. You can put a receptacle that has those two little buttons. One of them is a reset button, and one of them is a test button. So if you periodically test this, you press a button, and what it does is it leaks 3 milliamps of current off and sees whether or not the device is going to trip. If it trips, it works fine. You can push that little button, and it goes back and resets. This is a 20 amp receptacle. It is both AFCI and GFCI protected and it's $35. I point that out because a standard duplex receptacle probably only costs about $2. So these are much more expensive because you got a little computer in there. You don't have to have a receptacle with those buttons on it. Instead, if we go back and look at the service panel, what I did when I, this is a house I wired for Paul, and this is a sub panel actually there's no main breaker here because the main service panel has a main breaker and that cable comes from that to what's called a sub panel and Paul was putting an addition on his mother's home um, and the addition itself was wired with a sub panel so master electrician brought the current here and then once he got that here then I did the rest of it to the rest of the house and by the way, I did that not because I'm a licensed electrician, but because I did it on behalf of Paul, who owned the home, and the uh, all the work we did was inspected. I also was working with a master electrician to do the stuff that only he could do. Um, I, I'm not recommending that you do this unless you know a lot more about wiring than most people do. At any rate, if you take a look at these breakers right here, right down here, You've got a couple of buttons that are red, and over here you've got buttons that are white, and over here you've got another button that's red. If you look on this side, those are all the white ones right there. The white ones are AFCI protected on the entire circuit, but not ground faulted. The red ones are both AFCI protected and ground fault protected. So those right there are the two circuits above the countertop. And what I did here was I just protected First, they have to have AFCI protection. But if they're within six feet of the sink, they have to have GFCI protection. So I just protected anything over the counter. So no matter what, no matter how close it is to the sink, it's going to be GFCI protected. And then down here, that's the basement circuit. The basement circuit has to be AFCI protected. It also had to be GFCI protected because it's in an unfinished basement. Right now, by the way, if you have a finished basement, you don't have to have GFCI protected receptacles, but apparently the code is going to change in the next release, and that code will require basements, even if they're finished, to have GFCI protected receptacles. So that um, brings us to the last, uh, I guess there's two more slides. Two more slides before I finish this section. And then after that is the material that we covered in the Zoom class that did get recorded. And that's how to create a switching diagram, how to create a circuit diagram, and then the calculations for load that we'll be going over this week, which is something you, you do, do before you um, uh, can update your service or before you do a, a wiring job in a house. Now let's go back here. Smoke CO and gas detectors. All homes are required to have smoke detectors. 
at least one on each level. Basement requires one, first floor, second floor, living space. We have an attic that's not living space, it's not required, although it's not a bad idea. There has to be one in each bedroom and has to be one in the halls outside of bedrooms. They have to be replaced at least once every 10 years. One problem I have with these smoke detectors is, as you know, I have a fairly severe high frequency hearing loss, which causes me, you know, not embarrass me exactly, but I do have to ask you to repeat yourselves frequently, and I know that's kind of annoying. It's particularly bad for me with the high frequency, and it turns out there are a lot of alarms I can't hear. That's true of most smoke detectors, and as a result, um, when I discovered that, I realized that if I were by myself in my home and the smoke detector went off and I was sleeping, it would not wake me up because I can't hear it. So I have two things. I, first, I got a low frequency detector that can hear a high frequency smoke detector and then itself goes off with a low frequency sound and a, long, a booming baritone voice saying, get out of the house. But the other thing I, I've done since then is I got some of the um, Nest products, the Nest thermostat people, they also make a smoke detector that is something I can really hear well. And they're also Wi-Fi connected to each other. So if one goes off, the others all go off as well. This, these, these cost me a lot more money than a standard smoke detector. But, you know, if I uh, don't die in a fire, I, I think it'll be worth it. The thing that is not required... Um, in, by the, in the NEC, um, because it's not technically an electrical thing, at least I don't think it's required in the NEC. Most states do require, though, but only in areas if there's false, fossil burning appliances in the home. So if you have oil-fired power, uh, uh, boiler or oil-fired furnace or gas-fired or you have a wood stove, then most states require that you have a carbon monoxide detector. I'm going to make a big pitch to you for having one, period. And I'm guessing most of you don't. And the reason I'm going to make a pitch, and this, if you remember in class when we were talking, I told you that twice in my life, and I'm 69, so it's been a long time, but twice I was in a situation where I was overcome with carbon monoxide in a home because of faulty um, heating systems. First time I was really quite young. And uh, that was when I was telling you my father was going to work and coming home and my, his whole family was sick. My mother passed out when we were home. I, I was unable to help her get into her bed. I was so weak. My sisters were both um, in bed. And he called the doctor and the doctor came out and says, okay, you get these people out of here. There's carbon monoxide in here from the looks of it. And it turns out, in fact, our furnace um, had, had some cracks in it and carbon monoxide was being pumped right into the house. So we replace that, that heating system. Well, the house I live in now, when I bought it, the first thing I did was have it checked for that. And it checked OK. And when I was working on the house one time, um, redoing the sheetrock in the room with a big, um, there's a big plenum uh, register. And I was on a, on a stepladder. And I got very lightheaded and got concerned, got outside, felt better, called the company, the uh, heating company back. They came in and they did a much more aggressive review. And it turns out that the the fire chamber in the, in the uh, furnace had all kinds of spider crack, but they were covered with enough carbon so they hadn't been seen. When I said that in class, somebody else in class said that she had been overcome with carbon monoxide because of a heating problem. So my point is this. I've never needed a smoke detector, but I've needed a carbon monoxide detector twice. Most homes have smoke detectors, but no carbon monoxide detectors. Go buy one and put it in your house. Put it upstairs where the bedrooms are and, um, and keep yourself from, because uh, you can't really smell carbon monoxide. You just, it's just you breathe it and then it doesn't actually kill you directly. It just prevents your body from getting any oxygen. The other thing I'd recommend is if you have gas coming into your house, either propane or natural gas, a propane or natural gas detector is also recommended. I have one in my cellar. We use propane, so it's in the lowest part of the cellar, um, so that if, it, if there's a leak of some kind, it will be detected. Changes coming in 2020 NEC. This is what I'm told, um, and I don't know for sure that they were made, but the GFCI protection was expanded to include both 125 and 250 volt. I don't know why I didn't put 240 there. Receptacles supplied by a single phase circuit. Single phase has to do with how motors work. You know, you don't have three phase power in your home. Um, industry does. Um, at any rate, GFCI protection didn't used to apply to anything except 120 volt circuits, but now it applies to everything. 
in a home. Now your entire basement must be GFCI protected whether it's finished or not. And GFCI protection is now required for both dryers and ranges if the range is within six feet of the sink. Okay, that's the end of this one. Uh, the other Zoom uh, classes got recorded, so I'm not going to do any more of these, but I'll send you the link to this one, and then we'll move on from here.